Well, good evening, everybody. I want to put apologies in first of all about the heating. You may have noticed it's not very warm in here this evening. Uh, it's a test for me to find the caretaker to try and do something about that. So, if you want to put your coats on during the evening, please speak. feel free to do so. Well, it's the same temperature as in Edward's room. We're doing our best to say the touch camera. Oh, thank you. There's no man here at time. First of all, can we sign the minutes off of the meeting held on the 9th of October to correct record? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank for absence. Third, Councillor Thank you. Any other apologies? Declarations of members' interests. Please declare now what the time of the item on the agenda. Thank you. So the first is to provide the flag on the completion planning issues, which is community infrastructure levy, submission of charging to your council charter. Thank you, Chairman. I hope members will realise that they've seen all this before. And what we're, re what we're really reporting here is that as a result of the required uh, public consultation period, that uh, we believe that we are now in a position to submit the charging schedule uh, for independent examination, which is the next uh, milestone on the journey to the introduction of the community infrastructure levy. Uh, I don't know if you ploughed through all of the comments that people made during the recent consultation. Some of them I found quite interesting. Um, Developers said that the housing market was too fragile to sustain a mandatory charge on development, but uh, as Christine Keeler once said, they would say that, wouldn't they? Um, but they also thought that the rates were generally too high. Uh, people thought that um, it would be better if we had a joint arrangement with other councils. I'm not sure that that's allowed. Um, in fact, I think the only two possible areas of flexibility that we have in the uh, implementation of the community infrastructure lately is that we are permitted to consider the introduction of a, um, an instalment payment process and also I suppose that I ought to re report to you that it is possible to decide not to impose it at all, uh, which you might do uh, by just saying that all the rates are zero. Um, I believe it's true to say, although I haven't seen it yet, that there has been some recent further information coming in about the viability situation, which will no doubt be considered as, at the appropriate time. I was particularly interested in some of the uh, responses to the content of the proposed Regulation 123 list, the list of items that we might spend infrastructure levy on, uh, in a, those items which might be wholly or partly funded by SIL, uh, particularly the first bullet point that says that public art should not be on the list. Um, and I, when I saw that, I wrote no. Um, but that's just my view, of course. The uh, uh, council may have a different view. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it's also um, worth pointing out that it does at the bottom of page 15 that once uh, SIL has been uh, implemented that items that are on the regulation 123 list can no longer seek funding under section 106 agreements. In fact, section 106 rules change on the 1st of April next year uh, and that is why we are keen as quickly as possible to reach a point where we can introduce community infrastructure levy ourselves. Uh, just also to remind you, or to point out in case you didn't know, that community infrastructure levy, once it's been adopted by the council in due course, it then uh, can be applied to every decision made by the planning committee or the planning process from that date onwards. Um, you will also have noted that the parish council consultees said we should get more of it. Uh, unfortunately, that's not in our gift, even if we thought that they should get more. There were quite clear rules from Secretary of State about that. So it's not up to us to worry about that. Um, 
Our plan has been to work with the Joint Planning Unit, the West North Hampshire Joint Planning Unit, and to obviously take advantage of uh, the benefit of the scale and to have a joint submission of the three partner local planning authorities for SIL for public examination. But we have already decided that should that not prove possible, we won't let that hold us up. We'll go independently. So the charging, the proposed charging schedule uh, and associated documentation, the next stage is that they go to uh, public examination and uh, this we are already pursuing a timetable for uh, and when this happens uh, pre presuming that the result of that examination is satisfactory then we can uh, choose to adopt the infrastructure learning. Uh, so the recommendations for us to consider this evening are as listed on page 13, that the documents that you've seen uh, at least twice now should be approved for submission for independent examination, and those are the charging schedule, the regulation 123 list, and the instalment policy. We, we agree that it is sensible to consider the introduction of an instalment policy. That the comments made on the draft charging schedule, as you've had the chance to read again, uh, should be noted. And then the third one is, is a, a practical procedural suggestion that authorities delegated to the business manager in consultation where this is practicable with the strategic planning portfolio holder to consider and approve where appropriate changes that might be suggested by the examiner during the examination process or in their report. What this is, this is not to say that the business manager with or without the help of the portfolio holder should just radically rewrite the whole document. It's just that we know from our own experience of other things, in particular recently the joint core strategy examination, that it sometimes happens that during the examination the inspector or the examiner says, uh, can you just change the wording here or there? And we don't want that to be held up by having to go through the formal process of coming to strategic group and council, strategic group and council. So we would like that delegated authority. So those are the recommendations. Uh, and it's uh, then up to the group to decide whether or not they wish to uh, follow the recommendation, James. Do, uh, Council Chancellor, can I just ask one question? Uh, the core strategy is due for uh, consideration next month. Yes. And if that gets approved and adopted, then that means the SOL can then, after that date, is that right? The SOL can be adopted as when we're ready to do so. We can adopt SIL anyway, provided it's passed through all the. Well, I thought we could do that unless the plan was in place. Yeah, okay. Chair, one of the points about the joint core strategy has the evidence of what growth is coming, the information of what growth is coming, the plan of commitment of what growth is coming, and that's what we're facing the challenges on. So you need that context, I put it like that, from yeah. the two procedures. But we didn't be held up that's by the mandate. As you know, Chairman, it is anticipated that the core strategy uh, is likely to be adopted on the 15th of December. Okay. No, you said hope so. Right, Councillor Over. Thank you. Can I just ask um, Alan, perhaps, Councillor Chandler, in the issue, on the, on the issue of um, planning permissions, where land may be granted planning permission, but no action takes place. Um, did I read an actual plan that the backing actual plan can still attract a still level? It can, provided the permission decision was made after the introduction of civil. Because I just would be concerned that people who own business can sit on assets and we can borrow them back against those assets. And yet, as far as the community is concerned, that the benefit that feeds through to the community may be, in some cases, many years away. Yes. That, was, that was my observation. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Just, just to clarify what I, I think I just said, once we've adopted SIL, then it, it can be applied to every decision made from that point onwards. If a decision is made that someone gets permission to do something which attracts the levy, then that levy is payable. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Councillor Hills. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I did want to pick up on uh, uh, that some of the replies from the respondents were certainly made interesting reading. Um, I just was going to write a concern where it said the comment on public art, I agree entirely with the comments that Alan made. Um, one thing that I, I 
picked up the fact that I've been a bit thick on it. It said that these rates are indexed each year to reflect changes in construction costs. Um, now, does that mean that that's materials? Does it mean it's labour? Or does it mean the two? Because these things can uh, change quite dramatically, whether it's materials, whether it's labour. Sometimes materials can get cheaper as you buy, sometimes labour costs go up, etc. So I wanted to know if they reflect on those changes. I'm just going to the business manager's reply, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that the index specified in the regulations is the Building Cost Information Service All In Construction Price Index, and the name All In and give you the clue. It is the general inflation rate for construction, and that we think has been chosen by the government because most things you'll pay for uh, in, in still are probably construction in one form or another, and so it's the appropriate inflation measure to use. It's not going to have a choice anyway. Thank you, Councillor Hills. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, pick up on the observation in 5.5 about a potential um, risk of pressure on what the fiscal security planning obligations are to be affordable housing. Um, because I think we've heard this week that the government's ambition to um, remove the requirement for affordable housing provision in smaller developments. And I'm just thinking this combined with the, the threat that's sort of implicit on the sale. Um, does put provision of affordable housing in a sort of more vulnerable position than it is now. So I just want to just pick up on that last sentence in 5.5 where the sort of mitigation is, um, is suggested now, just to, just to request a bit more elaboration about what we're going to do to try and make sure that we don't lose uh, the requirement to provide such affordable housing as we can. I understand the point in time, but we didn't want specific moment I'm involved in one, but then if you want things to be delivered sometimes, you've got to negotiate the position to get a good community facility to deliver. Do you want to contact for some? I, I have to do so. Um, the reason we do the vulnerability work properly the is required is to try and make sure that what's asked for by way of seal isn't so much that it would cause significant problems elsewhere. However, seal is a general charge, and in some circumstances, other things are likely to get caught simply because it's levied at the same rate over a large area, and some specific sites uh, will have more questionable vulnerability than others. We have got, it, as what Bernard has said, some more vulnerability would just come in, but need to digest that. And if you're dealing with this kind of issue, we need to come back to Council um, to, to update things, then we'll do the same. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Gilpin, then, please. Um, just a couple of questions here, and again, I'm sorry if I'm being a bit sick myself. Um, but on the public transport, and I know we should What page get, is that, sir? Um, I'm looking at the list. Oh, so I'm just, yes, okay, that's fine. Uh, I know we should, should we get hung up on the list, and we shouldn't, um, it's going to be monitored each year. Uh, it's just a question, really, two questions. One on the public transport, is that from that help at all with um, rural transport for villages? Uh, I'm maybe getting confused with uh, capital infrastructure expenditure and, and the, the revenue requirements for subsidising service or something like that. And then the other one is more uh, thinking of the uh, Bible uh, situation. You know, I noticed we've got highways and we've got on and rescue and that sort of thing. But, and again, I may be getting confused with section 106 and still. But it's, what about the health? Can that help um, with the infrastructure required for health? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you could do that. Um, as far as public transport is concerned, the, the basic statutory underpinnings of said it's about, actually, and on the face of the act, it's about assisting development happening. So the infrastructure you provide, including public transport or anything else, has to be reasonably related to development that happens. It doesn't have to be the same development that pays the sale, but it has to be development in different somewhere. So if a village has undergone an appreciable amount of development that you could sensibly say requires an improvement of transport service, then you could theoretically use that heading. Whether there's enough money and all the rest of it is a separate decision, but in principle you could. Um, so it, it would depend on whether there's a push for development. Well, it can't be useful just to support rural public transport with no connection with development at all. Um, as far as healthcare is concerned, the list as drafted does not include healthcare. The reason for that principally was because there is a, a pretty definite geographical link with healthcare. The surgery is uh, particular geographies within most of the districts, obviously some have boundaries across, and therefore we've got those best addressed through the 106 system. 
I didn't to say it couldn't be changed in the future, but that, that's where we're at at the moment. Can I just come back to that point, actually, because I'm involved in it, on the health facilities to through one of the six or whatever means. It's not easy, by the way. And I'm just wondering, if you want a new circuit to see how it's getting a lot of growth, I use Walter as a very good example from Walter and Hendricks with the zeros there. Uh, obviously, the health service, obviously health service pulls money from growth, doesn't it, anyway? And then they decide where that money goes. I think what we're saying, more, more Pacific, yeah. If it's specifically directed at an area where, say, a new surgery is required to accommodate extra growth, does so anybody do that from still to help that process? Uh, you, is that you, a possibility? You, you could do, Chairman, and remember, there's nothing to stop this changing from what is realist in yeah. the future if yeah. we find that doing it through planning obligations isn't working and SIL is working and it's not sufficient headroom. Because remember, the SIL program will be under considerable pressure. It's not going to be a magic money tree that will produce enough money for everything we might want to do. And, and so, it is a delicate balance to try and get this right. Um, the response from, I think it was an commissioning, it might have been NHS England, uh, half of Shim South East England, but whichever it was, um, effectively said they wanted to see a levy for GP capacity once the existing capacity had been exhausted, which immediately leaves us in a sort of 106 territory, um, because obviously if you do it for a sale, you, you're levying it from everywhere. Um, so I, I think I would suggest it's best to leave it as is for now, but it's something that can be reviewed, and if we find it will be favourable to, to switch it over, that's a decision for council in the future, the inspector doesn't get involved in that. I'm just saying, for you to use that, it's a fair question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is our list, presumably, is it? It's, it's our list, it's no. the council's list, it's your decision as to what goes in it. Um, and in fact, one merit panel along with this is in theory, the examination can be slightly easier because you can say, well, look, all the things we're not funded through 106. The challenge is, though, if we put anything in, in this regulation 123 list, we cannot ask the planning obligations to it. Um, so it is very much a double edged sword. Closes your gate on section 106. Completely. I think at this stage, given we are intending to get to examination, we ought to put our best position forward. Yes. And at this time, what we've constructed will be our best position. Mm -hmm. The evidence behind it, because the examination will look at evidence. What responses have you received, for example, from the health providers? Mm -hmm. That is quite a telling response for now. Mm -hmm. 106, then we revisit. Okay, I'm going to explain that. Okay, that's good. That's worrying. Um, I have a concern concerning our transition period uh, until we actually adopt the seals on, on how we will be treating the larger planning applications that have a phasing element within the application. I understand that the outline application that has a phasing element and it comes to revise, uh, revise, reserve matters before seals have been adopted, then this automatically comes under the S106. But if the outline application comes to reserve matters after we have adopted SILs, then it can be dealt with as, as, as a new application because of the phasing element and would be subject to the new SIL charge and not the 106. There is an application going through our system at the moment that, which has this very problem. It's an application that for 200 in the first phase and an outline application for 1800. I fully accept that and understand that the first phase of 200 will go through under the 106. And have been told that the 1800 outline application, whenever it comes to reserve matters, that will also go through under the 106, even if the SIL has been adopted. If that is the case, then DDC, DDC is going to lose 9.4 million over the lifetime of the development. And the local community will lose 2.35 million. And these figures are used, uh, I'm, I'm using are the DDC's calculation for the sale. If we do not wish to lose this amount of money or of the sale payments, all we have to do is put a statement in the council's instalment policy that any outline application that has a payment, a, a, a phasing element within the application and comes to reserve matters will be treated as, as a new application and will be subject to the new SIL charge. Um, I'd like to make a proposal that um, we make a statement in the Council of Installments Policy that states when the outline planning application that comes to revise matters after we have adopted the SIL and has a phasing element in it, 
will be treated as a new application and the new seal charge will, be, will apply. No, I'm still that, Councillor Moran. And before we take that forward, let us get advice from the business manager on that proposal. Well, I know what, I, I, my, my response, I'm afraid, will be unsatisfactory because I would have to say that I would need to look into that further before okay. I understood whether or not it was legal. That's right, that's the point. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, um, the, the position, unfortunately, as far as we understand it, is that we can't do that. The regulations define what is planning permission um, and therefore when the seal bites. And in fact, they've revised them, I think, five times now, and always in the favour of government, I would have to say, uh, in terms of making sure that if a planning application is modified, it doesn't fit the seal and so on. So the, the fundamental point is a planning approval, planning permission, the, the key decision is taken at the point of the outline. That is when it's accepted that development will occur. And the mitigation package, the section 106 and the conditions, are set at that time. You cannot then retrospectively, if you like, impose it, however much you might like to. I don't entirely understand the, the logic of what you're suggesting. Um, so the law is set up in such a way that once you've got the outline, the reserve matters are, are, are still part of that outline and the 106 will govern the whole lot, so we can't go back and, and retrospectively apply still. I, I wish it was otherwise. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I've looked on the web at uh, other authorities that uh, have adopted the SIL, and they are accepting that uh, if an application has phasing in the, within the application, not talking about any, you know, that it's larger applications, they are accepting those uh, to be, when they come to the state matters to be passed as a new application and still charge. If you, if you check, like, uh, uh, can I ask that you, you have a look at it, please? This is okay. Sorry. Yeah, the chairman, we're perfectly happy to. I mean, we can see the, the attraction, absolutely. And, and um, it's there. You know, the, it, uh, if you can have whatever you've got, we've got between now and council anyway. Sure. Um, sure. And if there is a legally valid route, then we can certainly. Thank you. I think the point Council Warren actually is a very valid point because obviously we're here. I know you said DDC, but actually it's for the community base, it's not for us as a council to get some money. And if we've got this sort of money, because communities are always worried about this additional growth. We're talking about sustainable urban extension, that's the only size of yeah. you know, 2,000 in your case. I know there's others around as well. But I think it's absolutely right, you're extracting as much as you can, community benefit, I call it, for well, the benefit of the existing communities, those who are going to live there in the future. Is that right? I'm to well, I, 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 I was going to simply point out that in the circumstances which Councillor Warren has just described, and it would be my understanding that the Section 106 would be uh, drawn up under the current regulations, which allow you to more flexibility than they will after the first of April, when they, the benefits must be uh, site dependent. Uh, so I think there's a bit more flexibility. So it would be up to you it, uh, to draw up a, an appropriate Section 106 agreement, because what you cannot possibly do, allow to happen uh, is that somebody would appear to be being taxed twice for the same development because they agreed to pay in the 106, and then suddenly you're saying, and there's a still on top. I understand that. I think some people think the much more than the still there is an existing Section 106. Yeah, I'm not saying that's the case, but what, what perception? I don't think we actually know yet. Okay, right. <laughs> Okay, what I suggest we do then is you, as I said, if you've got time before council to get this further up a bit, we'll try. Is that okay? We'll so I'm right. happy with yeah. yeah. that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Paul. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to speak, not being a member of your committee. Just a couple of small points. Um, whilst I appreciate that um, within the um, recommendations, uh, three is left to the business manager and the institutional portfolio holder. Um, I have to say that both of whom I have to be faced. If I go to 4.6, um, other responses and comments, a review of, a review of the seal in 2016, um, I would suspect that that might be a route to go to appease those or, or to appease some. And then on the 1, 2, 3, Listing um, G is the Northampton to Kettering improvements. Um, would that be in favour of uh, Walton? Yeah, so it's, it's highway improvements to um, to account for the highland problems of traffic. So I'll be going that way with the water balance. So 
if anyone just says the bed and lodge not, so it's a good point because obviously one's going to have to experience a lot of growth, and that's why that first highway is included to go and drain. So, so that was his intention? The intention is to have a smoother route because of the heavy traffic. And, uh, it's been a bone of contention because all the villages want to stay as villages, and Bolton in particular, Bolton and Leveson are facing huge uh, growth to the level of what they see in the country, actually. That's what level, the level of growth. I'm very good to add, Chairman. I think I've said it here before, but it's been a long standing desire to improve that AP2 link. Desire. Uh, I remember doing a project on that when I first came to this council more than three years ago. And, uh, the decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think the bold point is associated with desire with need, and that's what we always have to test. But the desire to improve from country to country because of a growing area and it's only increased since those three decades. Clearly. It's like the time we got to, whether it's absolutely necessary to come to time, we'll see. That's why we keep on review. Thank you. Thank you. Paul again, yeah. yeah, the disappointment is that whilst much is made of the eastern end of the A14, uh, and then the feeder roads that come through our, um, our district um, seem to have um, piled into insignificance, and the A43, as I just said, uh, has been uh, an absolute nightmare for the last 10 years or so. Agreed, and also due to our lobbying, we know looking at the northwest bypass and the, looking at the link east west rather than just north south. Yeah, no more penalty. Uh, so I'm going to add on. I'm going to say, Jeremy, that it's my understanding that the work on the A43 resulting from the expansion through the SUE yeah. is going to be more than just simple tweaking. They want to actually realign the road altogether. They're starting work already on yeah. the expansion new roundabout. Councillor Ramble. Yes, thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to speak. Um, on the one, two, three list, I see there's some comments about you know whether the list should be in some sort of order. Um, are we going to put it in any sort of order? Because I think it's just clearer to know. I think not, Chairman, because I think that, uh, it would be very difficult to know what order to put them in, and how often would you would you want to be able to revisit that order? Because uh, you can't predict with any certainty when things will happen and therefore when funding will become available. And you've got to look at your, the list of things you want to do and decide almost on a, an ad hoc basis which has the biggest priority at the time. Are we happy? Um, we've got the recommendations before you, but the other piece of work that's going to go on before Council, we'll just pull up um, Council Warren's point. Obviously, you know, he's making a very valid point there that he wants to see as much money gain for community benefit out of any development. So, we just want to check out that point before Council. Are you happy uh, to set the three recommendations before you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, next, we'll take a look at regener regeneration employment issues. Dungeon Town Development Implementation Working Group. Turn to reference, Councillor Over. Thank you, Chairman. The purpose of the report is to seek approval for terms of reference for the Dungeon Town Development Implementation Working Group. This is something of a tie in our exercise. As members will be aware, the Dungeon Town Development Implementation Working Group, the BT IWG, Previously, the Town Centre Implementation Working Group has existed since the downtown vision was put in place in the early 2000s. From serving members were recalled, the work undertaken at that time by the Civic Trust, which was headed by the group, an important exercise which focused attention on how the town might develop, regenerate, and make the best use of its assets. This included a consultation exercise with partners, stakeholders, health service providers, Government and district civic societies together with leaders of youth and other interest, in other interest groups, and importantly, of course, the citizens of Daventry. Following this, Marcini Perrin, Associates, MCA, Charter Town Funders, produced the first master plan which illustrated how Daventry might advantageously be developed and make provision for the needs and aspirations of a growing and increasingly diverse population. More recently, <coughs> taking account of first effective independent rise, the change in social and economic circumstances. We adopted the 2014 Master Plan. It was against this backdrop that, all part, that the all-part implementation working group was established, taking advantage of members with local knowledge to examine and provide guidance, not without critical comment and, and submission, and proposals made by or in conjunction with the district council, its partners and stakeholders, not least amongst these, for example, Henry Boot, relating to regeneration and the development of Daventry Town. 
Chairman, if I'm a member, there will be no doubt of taking account of the terms of reference, which you will see appended, and I'm sure you'll be happy to endorse your advice, because they can recommendation on page one of this report. And I'm quite happy to do this. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any questions or yes, okay, fine. Councillor Randall. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, 3.4. The group will normally have meetings scheduled four times a year. I would like to see the group will have meetings four times a year because I know quite a few of them have been cancelled and then it sort of said there was nothing to discuss and then the following week you see something and you read about something in the um, local paper. So actually, I've, you know, this has happened a few times and it's been brought to my attention. So I would like to see if it's with the group, there's usually something to discuss, even if it's only a short meeting, so I'd like to see that four times a year. And on 3.5, where it says some matters by this group will be virtually sensitive, um, I think it will be easy if actually people attending these meetings know exactly what is commercially sensitive, so could they be put on pink papers? Because um, I know um, Lynn Taylor from the Town Council has recently come along. When she reported back, she didn't know what she was allowed to report back and what she wasn't because she didn't know what was commercially, what was sensitive and what wasn't. Well, I'm very concerned about that last point in particular because it should be, clarity should be there. Got that kind I can't answer that because the papers and the minutes of this which she would have access to and access from previous times in actual fact, they are highlighted, uh, and I can't, can't remember the colour, but I think in actual fact it's dark grey. My vice chairman there might well confirm that. So we don't go down. This is not. This is. But the point has been made, Chris, yeah. is that the it's not, it's not clear what is in. Well, no, that is clear because we, we highlight the areas that are okay. made clear at the meeting. Sorry, Bert. Chairman, the chairman of the working group yeah. tends to remind members whenever something confidential is discussed. Okay. Act verbally at the meeting, and as the chairman of the working group says, um, when the minutes are issued, they have the confidential items shaded in grey to highlight the fact that they are confidential, and there's a note on the minutes that says that is the confidential section. Okay, can you could do that back to Councillor Taylor to help us? Yeah, I will. The other thing I'll say yeah. is, how soon after the meeting do these minutes come out? No, no um, that I can't answer immediately, but certainly they come out usually a yeah, see that's the thing. That if they're if they're taking place quarterly and they're not coming out then to nearly the next meeting to me, that's way, way too long okay. because you're then talking about the next things that are coming up. We'll go back to that point okay. at the end when you thank you. Uh, okay. Councillor go back to the Councillor Robert. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to speak on the committee. I'd like to confirm first of all that uh, not only it, it uh, do the minutes highlight what is confidential? But our chairman has always been scrupulous in actually highlighting at each point where it's uh, appropriate that what we are discussing is confidential. I think we have endorsed this is all the chair. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, there are steps being taken already to help, but I think minutes coming out earlier would help. Um, right, I quite happy to follow the recommendations of the monitoring officer in actually uh, giving terms of reference to this committee. But notwithstanding uh, the point made in 5.3 of the report about um, leave and prosecution um, matters, I think there is a concern about one particular um, clause in that. And that's in the terms of reference Clause 2.6, because I understand it is contrary not only to general customer practice, but it's particularly uh, contrary to Local Government Act 1972, Schedule 12. Um, and I would imagine that that Local Government Act doesn't apply to district councils. Uh, it also it could be said that the representation of the People's Act 1983 does give certain powers to the district council. But I would suggest that if we're going to go down the route of formalising how we actually conduct matters on the committee, we should try very hard to ensure that we do comply with legislation. Could I therefore ask Chairman through you that the monitor actually looks into this particular uh, matter um, uh, so that in fact we can when he goes forward to council with this recommendation, that either 2.6 can be confirmed as being compliant 
with legislation, or it can be removed. I'll certainly look further, but I'll make this one basic point. This is not a committee. It's not a subcommittee. Of, uh, it's, not a, it's not a task panel. So in that sense, it isn't covered by the committee rules per se. And the point about 2.6 is when there's a need to have the meeting, if you like, kicked off to actually get to an appointment of a chairman who then takes over. I've done that in other guises, whether it be the Waste Partnership Board, for example. So that is a sort of standard practice to enable the actual process of electing chairman to happen, because someone's got to kick off, kick off the meeting. But it's not a committee, it's not a subcommittee, not a task panel, which is called by those general rules. I'll happily look further just if there's any complication, and if you leave that with me, then I can advise in due course. Well, I think, Chairman, if I may, uh, I would be happier if, if that was done. I, I take the point that it is working, but on the other hand, I think that um, it's important for our reputation that we are in line with whatever, um, even if it does not apply to a working group, that we're seen to be uh, in compliance with reputation. Well, that's fine. So I'll be looked at and clarified thank before full council. So thank thanks for listening to Council Council Paul? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, having sat on this uh, group, um, for a number of years, um, I would reiterate that once you are within the confines of the four wall uh, of a group meeting, then all matters uh, should be uh, treated as confidential. Um, during my time, there were several meetings that were cancelled. There was no point in having a meeting about having a meeting. If there's nothing to talk about, then you don't have a meeting. Strategy group is an example and at odd occasions during the year, strategy group meetings are cancelled because there is no business. The worth of this group, in my humble estimation, is the fact that it is a sounding board, it is a think tank, it is an opportunity to listen to submissions by developers, highways, Uncle Tom Cobley and all. Um, and during the consensus, during that meeting, uh, as Simon has uh, correctly said, there, there is no um, legal powers. They are not a decision-making group. Um, and it is there, as, as I said, in my estimation, as a sounding board of the tank, and it has served uh, Damagery Town and the urban uh, conurbations exceptionally well over the years. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Paul, for that. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Yes. It was related to the point of Councillor Lomax's query about the, the status of the group, I suppose. Oh, yes, yeah. I appreciate that it's a working group, not a committee, it's so clear. Um, and I presume for that reason that there's no reference to political balance in the terms of reference because it's not a committee. Uh, and yet, historically, there always has been a, a diversity of political groupings represented on the working group. And I just wondered whether there would be an aspiration to include that in the terms of reference to continue that good working relationship between. Well, I think it's very implicit, but it's well, so explicit. Well, I guess, I mean, I think it was in the care of the sort of Magna Carta, and that was in the care of the mental of course. It was Magna Carta, and the question, which to some extent my colleague Colin Paul has answered, in terms of cancellation meetings, but you do not want in Acrobat to go to meetings which, which are worthless in the fact that all we do in Acrobat is, is just repeating stuff that has taken place at previous meetings. Yeah. We will do that when members sometimes drop out and people come in because there's a reason sometimes for, 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 for that to happen. But in terms of the use of officer time and the use of the premises and the cost that go with it, and we have to be, we have to make certain that in fact that these meetings take place and they are positive meetings with an agenda within Acrobat. Is, which is fresh and it really takes form with the, the, the proposals that we are involved in. So the reason there has been some time to come to the meeting is because there hasn't been um, any really further business to right. discuss. So we don't set out a pattern at the end of the beginning of the year that there will be four in the year and you have them because... The, you know, I think that's Councillor Randall's point of permission, it's not Councillor Campbell's point. So that's... So no, I, know, I just wanted to address that right. that point okay. at the same time. I mean, and Councillor Campbell's point, you're happy to address that now? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm happy. Yes, if, if, it, if it's, I mean, it's been quite interesting because some members of the political groups here 
have been absent from this from time to time, and they've been in and they've dropped out and they haven't turned up, um, despite the fact that um, certainly they have been, they have been aware that uh, we were involved in their interest. But if you want to make that as to say it should be implicit, then I'm quite happy to let them know. Good. So at the moment we're agreeing it's implicit, and my suggestion is that it's explicit, and you're happy with that mm. suggestion? Yeah, that was great. That was great. Absolutely. Well, it's a turn up, sir. <laughs> That's important, isn't it? You're off the process. I think you need to make certain that the Labour members in particular do turn up, because I think they've missed out to some extent. Well, I think part the last time I didn't turn up was because the papers weren't circulated to you, and I think you apologise for that, so thank you. Well, I usually do, don't I? That happens. Well, the dates should be met. But I just think it's fair, it's fair to give a, an accurate statement. The dates are known the year in advance. The dates for the year in advance. Yes, but the, yeah, the papers weren't circulated. Okay, uh, I just make a comment, Chairman, that obviously the appointments to the working group are already in place in terms of this year. And the council. Uh, next year, and, uh, sorry, next year, and the council will be looking at appointments to bodies and groups, and we will apply the rules accordingly, and where the rules don't apply, it's up to the council then to decide to follow the intent, as indicated yeah. here, to uh, offer the same sort of principle. Thank you. This is a very, this is, I think, a very interesting group of people, um, a very interesting working group to be involved in. And, you know, sometimes we see things that are sort of coming over the horizon and it gives the opportunity for local people to comment on those, and particularly when they have local knowledge and experience in this matter. So I think it is of considerable value. As was my colleague said, this is not a decision making. No, no, but I think actually it's, it's had only over 10 years or so, Chris, and uh, yeah. I know you've been uh, chair of that over that time, but <coughs> let it very well. Councillor Randall. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, the only point I was coming back to is the one that, um, about people not turning up for it. The last meeting, I believe, when, when we'd had a change, was the people that were supposed to be on there didn't receive their paperwork, so they didn't come up. And the people who had been taken off did receive the paperwork, so actually attended. So in our case, it was Olwyn shouldn't have attended. She received the paperwork, and she, she probably was still on the beat and attended. And Councillor Campbell didn't receive hers, so they didn't go. And I think actually, was it someone on your group? Well, I'm not sure maybe. He didn't receive notification, so he didn't go either, I think. So. Are you saying Councillor Lowe didn't realise she wasn't? Well, well, she received all the paperwork to go to the meeting. She, she wasn't on the group, though. So she went to the meeting because she thought, oh, perhaps there's been a mix and I am still on the group. So she went and obviously... Well, I let the chairman deal that outside so, this meeting. Okay. Well, well, yeah, yeah, no, this is quite an interesting point. That's, this is, you know, my, I think this is it's chair, quite interesting so. because um, I, don't, I didn't really want to mention names, but the name you just mentioned actually had to be notified several times prior to this and I never turned up on that occasion. She has been <coughs> in fact, I had circulated who was leader of the group who would welcome um, that council on board. And once again, uh, we did not uh, turn up when any member of the Labour group did turn up, so I thought it was rather disappointing. But don't let him forget to debate about this. This has been a worthy organisation, it's been very, very interesting, it's played a role here, and I hope they will continue to do so into the future. Thank you, Steve, Chris. Right, I wanted just one point to clarify, which was raised earlier, is this issue about the minutes and how long it takes for to come out. I know you're a very busy man, Simon, I mean, you've heard the feedback, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you have a deal on that at all. I, I would be. <coughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, the minutes, I think, just to be fair, haven't varied in the, the speed we're living for producing. We'll certainly try and address that. I think it's not just notice based on the point it's not made. I, they do tend to come out just before the next meeting, in my opinion. We'll certainly try and issue them again at that point. Yeah. It's the first time, and we haven't done as well as I would like to speak. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. It's not a criticism, I'm just being some what point we've made. If that can be in any way helpful. Well, we'll try to approve on that. Okay, thanks very much. Do you, Councillor, are you happy to set the recommendations? Thank you. Can, uh, right, access and communication issues, ICT strategy 2014 yeah. to 2017, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to seek approval for this recommendation to be adopted. The areas of interest to members are in section 4. Um, there is a lot of technical information here from the report, which I'll presume that everybody has read. Um, it includes projects in, in undertaken in section 9. Uh, their outcomes with target dates. Happy to answer questions from members, but I may need to ask support from any in depth uh, technical questions from the officers. Thank you, Mr. D. Uh, Ms. Lutthoff, are there any questions for Councillor Howard? 
I, I have a comment, Chairman, for Councillor Howard and also for uh, the Resources Manager. I, I did study this because it's an area of personal interest and I, uh, I was very pleased to see it. I was very pleased to see that it's uh, got a lot of up-to-date thinking in it, which is always pleasing. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to note that we are moving away from dependence on any particular hardware supplier by using virtual servers, uh, which we've been doing for some time anyway, but that, that's a valuable thing. I was just wondering whether uh, we are keeping our eye on the ball, as it, were, as, as it were, regarding the position of software. Some software suppliers, Microsoft in particular, are becoming particularly awkward about uh, the currency of, of systems and for example only this week I received notification that anyone using um, uh, Windows Server 2003 after next April is on their own. So that, that I note that we're up to 2008 so that's okay but it is sometimes difficult to keep up with these people uh, and it would be possible to think outside the box and think of not being so dependent upon some of these huge uh, software. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, we are at the moment going from XP to um, Windows 7, and that for at least three years I'm aware of should be supported. So I don't think there'll be an issue there. Um, but Windows, um, we know that they have come back to us in the past and asked for extra money because of our systems that we've got. That's a quick time, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, just add to that, Chairman. There, there, there was an issue that came to light during the course of, of the current financial year where Microsoft came back to us because of the way that we used our servers right. and the, um, the way that they, the regulation or um, that they applied to their licensing. So we, we are up to date with that. Um, and yes, we will watch carefully. Um, but, you know. Indeed, we, we can't, Chairman, but people will realise that Microsoft have a very dirty trick, in my view, with when they issue an operating system and then they immediately issue a new version, which they don't call a new version, they call it an update. Uh, six months later, that allows them to implement their other policy, which is that they only support two generations of operating systems, so the support for the previous one is cut off. And that's why the XP users are in the mess that they're in, and Windows 7 users will be in that position very soon. They wish to eat that. Mm -hmm. uh, right, Councillor Lomax. Oh, Sorry. 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 Uh, as far as IT is concerned, I'm afraid I'm in the dark ages, so uh, perhaps I, I should be making any criticism at all. I put, I've had to read this several times before I could understand it, because obviously IT has developed its own language and it's not accessible to all of us. Um, and I just wanted to ask if, if we're going to have reports, I've had to read this several times, and some of it I still don't understand, coming out in plain English. Um, I would refer particularly to page 13 mm -hmm. of the um, page on the papers with this bullet point. I've, I've read that and I still don't understand. Which bullet point was it, sorry? Which bullet point? Uh, the fifth bullet point the fifth one that I've been seeing with the existing virtualization direction of travel. Five and a half lines for that single bit of contrary. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite difficult, even for somebody of moderate intelligence to understand. I'm happy to explain that, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Well, Councillor Lomax, as you just indicated, there's been a fail because I was trying to make that point when I made the reference to not being dependent on a particular hardware supply. Uh, that's, that's an interpretation of, of that. Uh, so the point we noted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Paul. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I, I, I share um, Councillor Chambers' um, reservations regarding Microsoft 77,000 for an SQL system. It's uh, uh, rather a, uh, a hard bullet to bite. Um, that after, I think, uh, several robust negotiations. Um, and perhaps our, our sister authorities uh, that use Microsoft, if they do, we can have a gain up. Um, there are a couple of um, 
couple of questions and a couple of statements, actually, Chair, if you'll bear with me. Um, on page four, um, rather than one, um, Langdon is also created on the self-service portal. Um, it doesn't mention anywhere that I can see uh, that uh, we are currently upgrading Lagan as we go. Um, on page 108, um, council remains committed to seeking opportunity in partnership working where mutual benefits can be just run before, sorry, the lack of common commonality in software systems may, may impede progress towards. So I would assume that work is going on on that. And then on page 109, the weaknesses, um, the IT services struggle to uh, meet requests to develop systems. Uh, and from my experience, it's not rocket science why they do, um, because they are understaffed. And I appreciate that it is redress further in the report uh, to take on a junior um, a personal view obviously I don't think that is um, sufficient um, there is a mention in there that service managers are not upgrading the system um, and its contents that's on page 111 6.7 service managers are responsible for the, con uh, for the <coughs> content and Obviously, some of them are breaking their hills, and I would like to see that readdressed. And uh, apart from the staffing and the requirement or the workload put on the ICT department, uh, I think the report is uh, excellent. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, good chair. Just coming back on the first point, so on. Um, uh, so the ICT strategic payment uh, themes and including customer service, sorry, page five. For, for that. Uh, that is actually taking us back and reviewing what happened from the previous strategy. So yes, the position has moved on from that. And that's the same in, in respect of the point about uh, partnership working over the page. So as we really say, that's what we set out to do three years ago. We've moved on and the, on the strategy now is reflecting the changes as we've taken on. In terms of the, the weaknesses, uh, and, uh, particularly around the capacity, this was something that um, was, was identified by the uh, soccer team uh, consultant who, who came in to do some uh, health check for us. Um, wasn't really telling us anything we didn't know. We, we knew we were up to our limits in terms of capacity. And yes, we did propose to address that, not just by a junior post, but also to use some um, uh, uh, budget, uh, identify budget to bring in uh, specialist skills as and when needed. So it will supplement the service both at a junior level and more expertise um, for defined pieces of work. Good news. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Chair. Um, on 4.1, um, on improving customer access to services, <coughs> is that to do like with online reporting? <coughs> So on page five, both the yeah, but well, yes, improving customer access to services is you know much progress has been made with the self-service portal. Is that to do with online reporting? Um, Chairman, if I may, the, the section of 4.1 4 is really reflecting, as I said earlier, the position we were at. Uh, three years ago and how we've moved forward. Yeah. In terms of the way forward, we then we begin to uh, the section on communications, penal communications, which starts on page 13, and this is talking about taking it forward again, which does include self-serve. Right, okay. And can we, can, because um, I've been asked quite a few times now about, can we now, people now upload a photograph? because they said they come to write a description and actually you can only put so many words in and then it runs out. So, um, you know, if you could put a photograph of a complaint, it's often far, far better to see, see a visual rather than trying to type a description and then running out of words and keep trying to cut it down and make it shorter. 
Chairman, so, so I'm, I'm not sure that we can actually through the self-serve at the moment, but there are other ways of getting photo photographs to us yeah. through email, through Twitter. Certainly something we can explore. Yes, yeah, no, there isn't at the moment, because I've looked at that myself with um, Tani. Uh, but can send an email if you've got issues um, attaching photographs in email. Mm -hmm. That's the most simplest way of doing it. But yes, I think we can, we can look at it, can't we? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Randall. Anything else to add, Councillor Hand, before you finish your uh, No, uh, just my conclusion is that this is the strategy for 2014 17 um, to support the services over the next three years. Uh, hopefully, this will improve the quality and effectiveness of our services to the residents. Thank you, Steve. I'm happy to agree the recommendation. Thank you. That's Councillor Howard. We move on now to the source issues. Uh, the first one is planning appeal or legal talk. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Um, this type of report before the Planning Appeal Committee is a review of the progress of the West Coast Planning Appeal. It is vital that these appeals are properly presented. Failure to provide an adequate defence. Um, other reasons for refusal or could be to an uh, order of against us, which could be a little bit of The Dutch Chief Necessity is approved to use of contingency funding to meet these costs. However, if there's not sufficient contingency funding, then it is recommended that these costs are left to be marked in the reserve. By providing a robust defence, DDC has taken a prudent approach and it is hoped that the likelihood of the world is significant costs against the house will be reduced, so thereby, as I said before, I'm sure you can still do this. I was actually at that, uh, uh, I feel this there, so I suppose we can do this there. Are any members want to have to accept the recommendation? I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Evans. Uh, yes, it's, it's simply a, a question of uh, information. Uh, in uh, January, in my ward, uh, the council will be defending uh, at a public inquiry. And I just would like to be reassured that we will be having something similar in relation to the robust defence of that um, in course. Uh, uh, yes, certainly. We, we do put certain arrangements in place at the proportion of either using our own house legal or bringing in external uh, legal support from council for their witnesses. So if we're through an inquiry, we will be putting it there. Have a very short time. Thank you very much. How's the ball going? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it might be worth, um, I wonder if Simon has it in his head, um, in recent months, how many um, applications have, have gone to appeal um, and it could be granted in favour of DDC where we, uh, and where costs have been asked, we haven't um, had to pay any costs at all because we've acted in a reasonable manner. You've got that information circulated to members of us. We're, 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 yeah, we've had no awards this year. Not very good then. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Happy recommendation? Yes. Thank you. That's your cricket's one going tonight. The next one is a Welfare Reform Council Tax Support Scheme. Okay, uh, this report before you ask the, the final council tax support scheme for 2015-16 degree. Uh, again, you have detail of this um, scheme previously, but um, and the history behind it. But for clarification, council tax benefits mean that has been localised and from April 2013 um, was abolished to replace the council tax support scheme. Unlike the council tax benefit, which was set by central government, individual local authorities, primary and council tax support schemes. Since implementation, funding for the scheme has reduced year on year and will be again for 15-16 by 15.6%. For DDC, the gap between the proposed grant to receive and the cost of the current scheme is 51000 for Northamptonshire County Council, the funding gap is about 459,000. 
The government confirmed that pensioners must be protected from any change in the new scheme, and authorities are also required to consider what protection is appropriate for vulnerable groups. And I know I've spoken myself in depth with um, Tony from all the reading in vulnerable groups. Financial modelling has been carried out. Uh, and one thing to note is that although there were instrumental changes on council tax collection rates previously uh, was 98.28% were on target to meet the 98%. In 1516, a grant will reduce further, as it's above 51,000. It is therefore proposed to increase the council tax liability from 8.5% to meet this shortfall to 20%. I know this was debated strongly before. The report details the impact this will have. The result of this would be our working age claimants would need to find more towards their council tax. One neighbouring authority currently charges between 8, 8, um, 5% and 20%. The Corby, Borough and South and Country Councils are not proposing to change their current scheme. What's their current scheme? Uh, eight, <coughs> East North Hampton is proposing to change its currency to 12.5%. Wellingborough is proposing to stay at 20%. Kettering, currently 20%, is consulting to increase to either 25% or 30%. And Northampton, currently 15%, is consulting on increasing to 20 and 25%. Those authorities currently charging 20% have confirmed that they have very similar levels of recovery to those paying the full charge of house tax. So I think that's important to note, that you're still getting the, the same amount of recovery. You don't have to increase it to find you don't recover as much. Um, we were required to consult with those affected by this proposal for six weeks and to take into account the results of that consultation. And that can all be found at 4.4 of the report. <coughs> Again, and I know I've said this before to you before, there are no easy choices in this matter, and hard decisions have to be made if we're to address um, cuts in funding. <coughs> it is also essential to consider the position of NCC and to a lesser degree the Police and Crime Commission. It is well known that NCC is in very challenging position. Against this, we need to generate, the need to generate income has to be set uh, the potential impacts on individuals before it's demanded that people are paid. For these reasons, it's to propose to pursue a 20% liability cap, that is paying 80% of affected individual health tax bill through the CTSS. This seems to be uh, the best balance <coughs> the well, there, there's, there's of the requirements. The proposed scheme from 2015 to 16 will still be based upon the existing council tax benefit rules. Therefore, the scheme will be means tested and will use the same eligibility criteria. The only thing changing in the scheme is the cap. To put this in, in um, pounds and pennies, it's £2.55 pence a week for working age claimant bills. The proposal uh, is still need a shortfall of 21,000. Uh, it's also in line with a growth to the general fund unless um, savings can be found within. As part of the budget setting process, work has been done to try and identify any savings or efficiencies in order to offset these potential costs. So I ask the uh, support the recommendation. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, think it's, I think we should point out, uh, thanks for the report, Councillor but um, she didn't have to acknowledge that there was a clear opposition to the proposal 57% or against the proposal as it went out, the one option that they got to consult on, which is um, And not just the proposal, I think expressed very great concern in the comments that are. Uh, written out in the, in the, yeah, in the documents. Um, and I'd just like to reiterate the concerns I shared when we first discussed this and put it out for consultation. It seems to me it's the poorest households in the district who are in effect going to end up having the biggest increase in council tax. Many vulnerable people aren't going to be protected, um, those on ESA and JSA, carers, single parents, or the many working poor. 
And I think we're all aware that this, you know, whatever political party we're from, this is the end game of government, which gives councils the responsibility for administering um, this, this kind of thing, at the same time taking away uh, their financial ability to do so. Uh, and it seems to me that the government's working hard to ensure that local councils just can't afford to protect the poor anymore. And I think I think we all need to acknowledge that. And I think it needs to be, you know, I think I think it's a, a disgraceful position to be in when we can't look, at, look after the most vulnerable people in our communities. Um, I had a couple of sort of procedural questions as well as as well as those statements. Um, I wonder why, in the responses to the consultation, we were usually in response to consultation, we're giving officers sort of interpretation and reaction to what comments have been made. Um, and I just noticed that that wasn't in this, this particular consultation response, and I wonder why. And then I also wanted to pick up um, a phrase that was used on page 136, and I wanted to, the third full paragraph, when it said that the majority had become used to paying. It seems to me that that isn't a very objective statement. The objective statement would be to say the majority continue to pay. I think used to, used, uh, have become used to paying is a subjective um, description. I guess how can we can possibly know if people have become used to paying? They may be paying, but they may not be feeling uh, used to doing so. If you see what I mean. Um, and I think that's those my comments for now. What well, I said is a lot said they're happy about it, and then just going to do. Yeah, I think used, I think the phrase used to pay implies a certain sense of satisfaction with the situation that we, we can't possibly tell. I don't think so. Just, 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 just respond initially. I, I, I can respond in that, yes, I know there's 57% against. Um, the results, um, anyone who's being consulted <coughs> to the increase uh, abound almost to be against, so that would um, account for some of the high percentage. Um, I'm not saying that I'm happy with the position we're in at the moment. Um, We've tried to, as part of the process, help the vulnerable as much as we possibly can. We're in a no-win situation. Um, if we're to maintain services, we do have to make these difficult, tough decisions. And um, I feel pleased that, you know, um, our neighbouring authorities are looking even higher to try and maintain their services, but we're, we're um, keeping these at the Understood. Um, yes, sir. Let me just back, come back on the comment Sir Councillor Campbell made about uh, the majority of people who used to pay. I think really the context of that is that previously they didn't pay, so they have become used to paying something. Right. I accept the comments and that the wording perhaps could be a little better, but that's the context of it. Well, fair enough, but um, can you also comment about the, uh, the Councillor Campbell made the point about the responses when it comes down by officers? Was that, was that, was that a very point? Uh, uh, yes, Chairman, uh, uh, for you, um, it is a valid comment. I mean, the, the, the responses are set out in the appendix, uh, but we haven't set them out in the table with a considering, right. consideration against each response that's been collated and summarised within the body of the report. Within the body of the report, okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> As with uh, a lot of things like this, uh, the devil is in the detail. Um, I suppose at this point I should declare an interest. I want to discuss the disabled. I am uh, clearly I am. Um, but it's only my legs that don't work. I'm a bit concerned, and I don't understand. In the proposals that retaining the current protections and incentives, and, and a lot of things are listed there. Uh, uh, but there is, a, there is an underlying theme which I accept and, and uh, acknowledge that uh, working age claimants are to be given less consideration than those of pension age. And that must be part of the uh, aim to encourage people to find work. And, and I support the, the aim. However, there is a small uh, cadre of people who are of working age but unable to work. Yeah, exactly. And I mean really unable to work, not just malingering. <clears throat> we used to have something called incapacity benefit, which doesn't exist anymore. So it's not easy to identify these people. You can say, okay, they get disability living allowance or whatever it's called these days. Uh, and you can say that they have worked, that they may have worked and paid a lot of 
their dues, their national insurance, all the rest of it. They feel they paid. Suddenly, uh, their condition worsens, uh, and they are told by the medics that th there's no way they can work. They are given a certain amount of support through ESA, but from my understanding of this, they are not entitled to protection as a member of a vulnerable group. So they're expected to pay more of the council tax. And I'm just wondering about whether I've understood it correctly, and if so, does anybody think that's fair? Uh, so perhaps before I give you my opinion on that, I should clear whether or not I've understood it correctly. Okay, thanks for doing, Jack. So I've been dealing with an individual in the district on, on this particular matter. I know Alan's our disability champion is also now. I can ask Alison how it's doing. So that's an do you want to comment on this point? That's something very helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, with regard to our disabled customers, um, I think it's probably helpful to explain first of all how, how the CAP part of it works, because I think sometimes that can be a little bit confusing. Um, what we look at is the amount of someone's council tax bill before we start looking at the benefit calculation, and then we, we have to disregard, at the moment, 8.5% of that in the calculation. We're proposing to disregard 20% of that. When you then come down to the remainder, we then use the same rules that we used to use in council tax benefit. But rather than looking at 100% of the bill, we look at a proportion of the bill. So, so in the calculations that we do, there are many incomes that are disregarded um, and many allowances that are disregarded. So disability living allowance, for example, is one severe disability. And incapacity benefit has now um, changed to person independence payments, which are also disregarded in the calculation. Um, when we come to families, things like child benefit, um, child maintenance are also disregarded. So when we look at people's income, see how much, when we compare to the government figures that they can afford to pay, we don't take any of those incomes into account. So the means testing is still working, but unfortunately, because we're now having to not look at the whole of the liability, it doesn't mean that everybody of working age is being asked to pay some new income. Yes, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> You've named the thing of whose uh, name I couldn't remember, the personal independence payment. And I, I think what may be happening in, in the particular case of the the chairman was referring to is that the person is uh, not yet uh, in receipt of kit because they haven't been through that process and yes, that may be their fault. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So I will pursue that off offline. The only other comment I wanted to make was that I went on to our website <coughs> being a person who wanted to know whether or not I was entitled to council tax discount under the current system, and I answered all the questions, and it gave me a very strange answer. Uh, <coughs> but uh, the, the questions on there indicated quite clearly that uh, there is a means test associated. Um, <coughs> if you have savings of less than £6,000, then they are not considered. But if you have savings of more than £16,000, you're not entitled to this consideration at all. Well, you can't get very far with savings of £16,000, but I presume that once you've used them up down to the £6,000 level, you then become entitled again. Is that right? That's the rules. Okay, well, I understand the rules. Uh, I don't like them, but uh, I did declare an interest there. I, I don't like them, but I understand why they're there. But I think the best advice that we can take back to the case in, that we're dealing with at the moment is that we must help them to explore how they get involved with the personal independence payment, but it sounds as though that will replace the capacity benefit, and that might be applicable in the case of someone who is uh, disabled to the extent that they cannot work, uh, you know, even with the best will in the world. I was told I could work because it's only my legs that don't work. Uh, but fortunately, or unfortunately, I'm past working age, so it doesn't apply to me. But I will pursue that, and I may come back to you for further assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Councillor Chancellor. Councillor Randall? Yeah, I think it was uh, very sad reading a lot of these um, responses, actually. And, and it was made quite a few times that actually when people are on these benefits, 
it, state, it says that it states in their letter that this the amount they are awarded is the amount they need to live on. So actually by taking more of them, we have actually plunged them below the level that the government deemed is livable. So how does that work? I don't understand. Well, is that, is that the case? Yeah. Yes, and I think you know, as, as we have said, we are we are we have been put in this position. Um, the um, the only other perhaps comment that might may be useful for for uh, for members if, if their constituents have queries is that these people also claim housing benefits, and we do have a discretionary housing payment fund which we can allocate to people who are in, in, in hardship. And um, so whilst we we are sort of you know. We're in the situation we are in with council tax support. We do have a little bit of leeway with housing benefits, and um, so that's perhaps something that people might want to pursue because that hopefully would alleviate that problem by giving people a little bit of extra help on the housing benefits side. Well, these members have heard that. The members can actually maybe even come across cases uh, pointing that way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Morning, Thank you, Chair, for coming to speak. I think, yeah, I think it's very sad reading all these um, comments from people. It's quite obvious that people are being really badly affected by this huge increase. It is an enormous increase, 11%, and I think we should have uh, we, we should have reduced it. We shouldn't have put that much on. I mean, regardless of what other councils around are doing, they can treat their people the way they like, but I'm concerned with the way we treat our people. Um, I think there are other ways of doing it. We could increase the council tax and then these people wouldn't have to pay any extra at all. Because we are taking off the really, really poor. It is disgraceful. It may be government policy, but not the hope of the government. And you could object to them, you could lobby them to, to, to alter their um, policies. Um, and also you could support some of our own propositions, like the Robin Hood tax which would take people out of this situation altogether, and a lot more other people would be better off as well. So the wrong thing you could do, which I don't think you all are doing, and I think you, could, you should not put on 11% in one go on these very poor people. They live in poor banks. Poor people are paying for this country's debt, and it's not right, Chair. I really think we should try hard to, to alleviate their problems. Thank you, Councillor Yeah, just to say that, you know, we are trying all sorts of ways to try, uh, address this as a council, taking it outside of this report, in that we're trying to generate um, other streams of income so we don't have to take such drastic um, decisions. We have increased the council tax. We haven't kept it the same year on year. Um, this is the amount we can consider best to balance the books and to keep maintain services and to take this council forward. Um, that is the recommendation going. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Council Law. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for that to speak on the of this committee. Um, I'm inter very interested in the comments that both you've made and also Councillor Chalmers have made. Um, I too have a resident within my ward who has approached me uh, who is of working age and who has severe uh, uh, severe problems. And uh, any information that is available with regard to how any mitigations, etc., from either of you two gentlemen, I would be very grateful for, please. Thank you for Alison. That's my answer. Alison Harris. Okay. Thank so, you. Uh, my contact Alison, Chris. Thank Alison. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carr. Thank you, Chair. Um, the way I see it, Chair, is, um, I mean, I've had not many comments, and I don't see if we can go past this, uh, cut on to people on such low income. But at the end of the day, the governments have um, put us in this situation of saying that they're going to uh, cut the tax benefit budget. <coughs> and if, if we don't pass that on to people who are on the benefit, and try and fudge the issue, they say, boy, finally cuts out swear we hit the council. Um, I think we're fighting our duty. Um, the only thing we, we can really do is pass these cuts on to the people the government intended it to um, be passed on to, and let these people make their mind up at the appropriate time come next year. Well, thank you, Councillor Carr. Um, 
So you're going to put the recommendation forward on any? Yes. Yeah. So that's the recommendation before us. Thank you for the debate, by the way. And, uh, and that's a very most important as well. We had this before. And I, I think we do understand the impact of this one of the in the case. And it's, it's tough. And uh, it's trying to get a balance where you, you've got to find not just the one individual that's got five across the board. Uh, but anyway, can we move forward on the recommendation? Are you happy to support that? <laughs> Any against the chat group? That's a cab one. Thank you. I think I should be. Uh, the National Council Guild for the Treasury Management Strategy Statement and Annual Investment Strategies, Mid Year Review 2014 15. Okay, thank you. Um, the report before you advises strategy group of the Council of Treasury Management Activities for the first half of the financial year 2014 15. 3.3 of the report advises what the Mid Year Review covers, and section 3.4 that key changes to the Treasury Strategy. Section 4 details the economic workflow along with giving interest rates and forecasts. 5.2 of the report details that the underlying Treasury management strategy statement approved previously requires a revision in light of changes made by the three main credit rating agencies. Therefore, along with the credit agencies, a bit previous to the report, we will focus solely on the short term and long term ratings of any um, institution. This will, along with the utilisation of credit default swap, CDS, France Overlay give substantial credit ratings for institutions without the reliability of the support of the relevant sovereignty. Section 6 details the, of the Council's capital expenditure and 7 our investment portfolio. The Council's prudent approach and risk averse policy continues to drive our investment strategies with no returns on future diminishing balances being achieved. I therefore ask you to approve the recommendation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Councillor Gilford. Uh, are there any questions from the uh, two recommendations before you see Councillor Paul? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, um, I look at page 156 and see the mature, uh, maturity date. Um, of some of their investments and all I can say well thank you Doc, thank you Doc um, there um, will be I'm sure better opportunities out there um, but are we in the current economic climate looking to um, review our criteria I know in the past it's been very tight but are we um, in this current climate looking to review it in any way uh, order. Set that question, Chairman. We, we do our annual investment strategy on an annual basis, so the new investment strategy will be coming to strategy group in February, where we review all of our criteria. Um, what I would say is that um, our criteria is, is particularly tight. And um, I don't see that changing uh, in uh, the proposals that I'll be putting forward in February or any time thereafter, really. In fact, uh, whilst um, in some element it is a little bit more stable, it's very fragile. And uh, I have no intention of changing the criteria going forward. Well, I think the Prime Minister has actually indicated that in the last few days. And he might have all the reasons so yeah. about the world economy yeah. you know, and what might come out. Councillor Ever. I suppose we are getting a change taking place in our culture because we're going down the best world route, you know, That's right. which is perhaps a more lucrative approach. And whilst it's not without risk, and then history has shown us here that even investments like this are not different quite not without risk, but that seems to be, uh, I think, a uh, change of strategy there. Right. In that direction, I think it's benefited the community to the industry and the that we're often supporting, and I think that's uh, something that uh, perhaps uh, Council Bill might give you note. Interesting, that's right. I think there's a topographic way on the um, on the table actually on the Bank of Scotland, the last one. It says maturity dates of September May 2014. I assume that should be 2015. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Apologies. Is it 15 or 16? It won't be. We don't do anything for longer than a year in our current space. Okay, thank you. That's all. Yes, Councillor Campbell. Well, just, just a quick factual uh, yeah. query about a reference to the Luxembourg Primary School meeting with the Council Council. Oh, yes. I wanted yes. to elaborate on that because I'm not sure what it refers to. 
Sorry, I'm missing the It's about the Mansfield Primary School paragraph. What the meeting is uh, I know Amanda can give a much better explanation than I do. And I'm referring to our business manager. Sorry about that. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we've had a very good engagement with MCC about this school. They're, they're working very happy with us to run the academy selection uh, procedure. And the slippage which shown, is shown there reflects the program we agreed, agreed with them. I have to say there will be more news on that in the future because the developer has become rather less helpful. Um, and so they've made further decisions on that in due course. We are seeking to all that if all possible. But this reflects the programme that wouldn't deliver that in 2016, I think. Um, as I say, they've made further changes, but we're seeking to avoid that. I think so. Are we have to accept the two recommendations? Uh, this one is 2015-16 capital revenue budget and medium term financial plan and council bill. Okay, thank you. Um, the report before you provides a financial overview of the 2015-16 capital um, <coughs> and medium term financial plan. I'm, I'm going to presume that you've already in detail before this evening. Since the previous projections were presented to council, the medium term financial plan assumptions have been further updated as per 3.2 of the report. Um, the following issues and proposals have been developed as part of the 15-16 budget setting, uh, pro uh, a medium term financial plan process, settlement funding, non-domestic rate retention, new homes, uh, bonus, brokerage, etc. as detailed in the report. I will bring you just to 1.4.19 of the report, and as the council charged uh, previous to this, in the, regarding Overston Hall, um, there has been a slight change in that um, it had been proposed to be a 1 million spend uh, um, to generate uh, a 1.5 million income back, but now um, I'm going to go 1.1. Right. I'm going to remember here maybe um, or you can confirm this, but I understand it has now gone into um, a negative position and this will come before you possibly at um, a future meeting in that the um, spend is one million but the income now expected is six hundred and fifty thousand. Um, so it, although it appears like that in the plan it will be coming to a future meeting. As it said, take point quite good one shows the updated position. Section 6 details the capital position listing the new schemes. You will note the plan has now been extended by two years. So um, we're getting a clearer picture of what's happening in the future. As in previous years, this council has responded well to the challenges that severe cuts in funding support. I know I'm, uh, uh, it's one of my favourite words, and I know it's one of all his favourite words, but again, our prudent financial management continues to pay dividends and allows the council to respond in a considered manner to changes in funding levels. I therefore ask you to approve the recommendations within the report. Thank you, Steve, Council for Yes, it's, we are very prudent and also ambitious and, and dignity to go and be challenging. Uh, also, I noted in the report, of course, on um, uh, 4.23 about the award of 2% for uh, for staff and meeting unison, and obviously built into the future years, but then in dignity. So I just want to highlight that to members. Uh, are there any questions uh, for members? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Randall? Yeah, thank you. Um, 4.9 on the Everson Hall. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, 4.9. 4.19, sorry, 4.19. Sorry, Tessa, it's an extra one. On a report done um, for a fair few years ago, and I think it was Tony who did the report, um, it was deemed that, um, you know, that that hall uh, so, had so much damage and so much over the elements that actually um, it wasn't worth, it would cost too much bring it back to um, any significant sort of building um, and that was in his report that he'd done at the time um, 
so I still don't understand, you know, where, where we've gone with this one. If it was being, you know, that years ago, and it's now had more and more weathering, what, what are we going to do? Spend this money and get a quote to see how much it's going to cost? I think it might be signed badge rather than telling them. No. Was, it, was it Simon who did the initial report? I, I suspect, Chairman, Councillor Lambert would have done years ago when yeah, telling well, you was long years ago. Oh, right. oh, 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 it's no control, right? But I think, Chairman, that that report, the, the, the specific report which set that, came to that conclusion about the building was, was not valid. That is correct, Councillor Chancellor. No. Uh, and to quote somebody speaking earlier, they would say that, wouldn't they? Yeah, uh, no, it was a report for the owners of the building, reflecting uh, yeah, yeah. consistent with yeah. which is to say we should be allowed to demolish this thing. Well, yeah. if you only ruin this building, it's a tempting thing to want to say. Which way we're at it is there would be a need to pursue restoration um, to put more of the council's money into this than we originally envisaged. Hence, the report says, okay, reflect that in the program, council's financial programmes for now, but we will come back to members with a full report on the situation for your approval before we engage in any material expenditure. So it will be a decision from members whether you're satisfied at the time that the balance of risk and reward is sufficient to justify proceeding. Thank you. No, just so so who's gonna do who's gonna do that assessment and price it up of how much it will bring it, you know, if, if it's now feasible to bring it back in. Well the officers. The officer did yeah, do it Fine, Sorry, 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 dropping the gun there. I do apologise, Councillor. Um another one. On the um uh six point four um, on the cashless parking arrangements for oh, yes. the country park, what is a cash? What, what what do they mean by cashless parking arrangements? How will people be paying just by a card only? Because they like phone. Phone. Yeah, phone payments. Right, because and that would be smartphones. Yeah, really. Right. Okay. So because a lot of elderly people go down there with grandchildren. A lot of elderly people haven't got a mobile phone, so what would they do? Not be able to park there? We will have a transitional period where we've got both operating, but the intention is to ultimately go to the cashless system. So if you haven't got a phone, you can't park there? Yes. Okay. Um, and the next one was on the Lodge Road enhancements. Um, obviously, um, you know, more cars are using um, that area now. Um, and obviously it's, it's supposed to be a, um, a restricted um, traffic area. Um, and I read the press relief of what, you know, that we may have there. What I can't understand is why, to me, it would be very simple, actually, at this end of the road, you have those drop-down sort of gas bollards that they have um, over in, I've seen them in Kettering and well in Bristol, so when the bus comes along, I don't know how they do it, if they get or what they recognise, but they instantly, so if it's an emergency vehicle or a bus, coach, they drop instantly straight to the floor, those vehicles can pass, shoot back up, um, and no cars would, you know, it would just make it, it one way in, turn around and go back out here. So two things. One is to make sure we do things that, in highway terms, is safe. And I appreciate some examples that can work mm -hmm. suitably, but in other cases, when you're backing onto, for example, Abbey Street, we've got to be a little bit careful. Second point is there's a visual quest here. We're trying to do something that makes it look better as a space as well. Here we are in front of our civic building, the civic kind of civic centre, if you like, the road centre across the road, etc. And we've got this road which is just ploughing through it. So there's a double quest here. One convenience, functionality. To, there's, a, there's a chance to make something look better as well, which is part of the generation of general questions. Okay, Councillor Randall, do you want to discuss that point as it comes to Chancellor? Yes, I'm uh, concerned about the Lodge Road uh, <coughs> amendments uh, regarding the access to the disabled parking spaces, both for this office and for the leisure centre office. We'd have to accommodate vulnerable, let's use that term again, yes. vulnerable people. Yes. Thank you, lovely sources, okay. Councillor Randall, any more? No, only that it just, you know, to me, when you're spending all that money, you're talking about cutting money from some people and plunging them into poverty, and then you go and put something there. And, and actually, I think that that is also under a, a 106 contribution. Um, have we got... Um, well, that a, is. 
it, yeah, it says here, funding yeah. for this scheme yes. will be assessed well, so from Section 106 yeah. contribution. That's where the money's coming from. Yeah, right. but from what, from what development? Is it, and under that 106, does it specifically say to be used for that, or is it an enhancement within the town? You know. Can you just call some of that detail if you can say that? Well, I think so. I'm, yeah. I think all of the Marine Mail, correct me, are marked as town centre specifically. Um, so there's a fairly narrow one. The point is, it's different funding streams, council members. We made statements like I just made, it's not right. You can't compare one thing to another unless it's like to like. And section 106 is different to what we were talking about earlier. So I just want to get that point across. Yeah. You made a statement. Just, I, I can understand that, yeah. but that's not yeah. how people see it out there. Well, the it won't do if you say things like that. It won't do like that. But the other thing is, is, to me, when we are going to do enhancements, and it is going to be, you know, it is for the town, we actually. <laughs> Should we go out to the people and ask them what enhancements they would like within the town? Well, we've been, oh, sorry. Right. I, I can actually respond to that actually. Um, and we've been under a lot of pressure to do something about sorting out that area. From both County Council highways, from members of the public use, and both these buildings, and from the police. It's, it's come up over the last two or three years frequently. Um, through the joint action group because of that, the issue of that road. Because at the moment it's kind of, it looks like a road, but you know, it's signs of expected pedestrian only. So it's, you know, it's it's been a it's been a long term problem that keeps coming back again through um, the joint action group. So that's part of the reason why we're looking at um, making those improvements. That, that's why I put forward my suggestion to have those drop down bollards and spend some money back somewhere else. Any Councillor Randall? We have been consulting the town for many years, by the way. A lot of lots of areas. Right, Councillor Paul. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'll go backwards if I may. Lodge Road. Um, if it was stopped off by County Highways at that end, and the parking bays, or you could create a parking bay, which would then service the shops that are out here and solely for the patrons of those establishments. Perhaps those establishments wouldn't fall empty so many times or extend that through uh, <coughs> uh, to encompass um, some parking bays at those shops. I regrettably have to agree with Councillor Randall. It doesn't come easy. Um, a cashless parking. Uh, system at our country park. Um, I would have to question that um, purely and simply because I don't have a smartphone. I have a phone with a smart person that holds it, but I don't have a smartphone. Yeah. If I go into London, I have to dial a number. If I have to go into London, I have to dial a number um, and then they give me parking um, authorisation. Um, I don't see that as a way forward. I mean, if you take Stanwick Lakes, is it over near Edinburgh? Um, simply a coin-operated barrier system um, that served them extremely well. Um, and the other one is Overstone Hall. Um, I agree with Alan that there, there was a report. It wasn't by us, it was by them. And uh, they can say whatever they like. However, the previous heritage um, champion um, presented a report at some time, and um, I'll try and tie me down to a date, but probably four years ago, with regard to Overstone Hall, um, saying that the, the hall itself, as a listed building, and I'm sure Alan will correct me, as a listed building, um, the building can be, in effect, a ruin. Um, as a lot of listed areas are, that they are just ruins. And perhaps um, um, Alan can uh, work with officers going forward. Um, I don't see the worth of spending millions of pounds. Pink papers tonight, we're talking about spending money and we're talking about getting a return. If someone can prove to me that the return for Overstone Hall is beneficial to our ratepayers, I can talk about the pink papers saying that that is an investor save scheme, along with the crematorium, along with High Force, etc. Um, but I don't see Overstone unless there is um, 
unless there is a land pocket there that is available to sell. That's Councillor Paul. Councillor Gilbert, Just to come back to the purpose of the report, that yeah. this is an overview of the medium-term financial so. plan. This is not where we're meant to be debating the individual um, areas. Individual reports will come back to the appropriate meeting. This is just to let the council know how we are at this point in time in um, a, a specific um, uh, in the financial area. You are giving approval for this as we uh, the recommendation goes forward, but there will be reports coming back to council. Well, if you tell the say it's going back in time, the report you know that members are keeping or watching the I That's very important, Well, that's good. That's yeah. good. I'm sorry, uh, Audrey, you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to be clear. Obviously, in terms of members' approval tonight for, for these schemes that I've put forward, yeah. but in particular with the Overston Hall, yes. that was to reflect the position that we are in, yes. um, and that on Overston Hall there will be a further report mm -hmm. before any uh, major spend. But for the rest of the schemes, uh, I'm there for members to recommend approval and otherwise. Thank you. One other, one other point, Tony, I think you mentioned about iPhones. I think any phone, you just need to have a mobile phone, the number up. It's not any, I don't need an iPhone. I think that's right. Yes, um, yeah, I was just making that point. And Northampton Station, for instance, you have credit cards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Credit cards. Yeah. 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 Park. Yeah. I mean, it takes up a huge proportion of the income that goes through parking because of vandalism. So it, that's where it's blowing um, the cashless okay. parking as okay. a means to combat that. Okay, thanks for that uh, confirmation. Uh, sorry about this, Councillor Hills. I didn't miss you off. I just put a comment on for you. That's all right. I'm a patient there, Chair. So uh, yeah. I'm not going to worry from that point of view. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the point I was going to make is it, it's very similar to what uh, Councillor Gilford said. What we're looking at is the um, criteria of the medium term financial plan. And we're looking at proposed new schemes and revised schemes. Now, when we come to Country Park, uh, part of my portfolio, I agree that this area certainly needs to be upgraded, etc. I do have some concerns about it being cashless, but I was comforted by the fact it says the scheme has to be approved by planning permission. So I see that's the way that we should go forward on this. There should come some reports forward on it. We may or may not agree, and then it's got to go, if it is agreed, go in front of planning, because I, I generally feel that if, if that comes about, I think there will be a lot of concerns. And I, I take that from people that I've spoken to down at the country <coughs> park. So that's the way I see it. I welcome the country park, the refurbishment of the open spaces, and what we've got here under our revised schemes. But each one of these will then come forward as reports, and they will be taken in that context. That's the way that I see it. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly support, if you like, the depth and breadth of what's in this report, but then it's got to be defined a bit nearer the dates as these things come forward. Thank you, Councillor Hills. It's also good to see an extra 30 parking spaces. Yes, it's a good part. That's yeah. very positive. Councillor Morgan. Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me speak. I think it's pretty straightforward. I agree absolutely there are, there's a lot of detail in here which we can consider in due course. Um, it's, it's kind of, again, nearly one. I think it's excellent that there will be extra parking spaces as part of the proposal for the country park. And actually, speak here as a ward member, of course, uh, of Abbey Safe. And uh, when we've been visiting the um, local premises across the road, uh, around, etc. We often get feedback about the uh, people parking in those areas and restricting the local residents. So that would certainly be welcome. However, um, when we do consider this, um, a parkless, uh, sorry, parkless, a, uh, what's it called? What's it called? A cashless, thank you, not a parkless. A cashless, um, we don't encourage uh, unintended consequences here. So what I'd hate to see in actual fact is people not want to use this particular system and they in actual fact increase the pressure around parts of our warning. And, uh, and also, um, 
the, the, just the, the strange thing, actually, it's kind of social etiquette. We don't have people walking around the country park on there gathering away on their phones and disturbing the wildlife. So that's, that, they're all serious points that have not been considered in due course. Thank you, Councillor Walton. Thank you. That's right. And this is normally one again, get looking back, but of course what I want to be careful is that we don't end up with people parking anywhere on Northern Way on the verges. And we ask you to take them some to block that. There are opportunities all the way along there, and it doesn't take long that once some of them start to then many follow. So I think that uh, this does need to be ruled out very, very carefully. Well, again, comments from Ray's comment about the implementation of the other phase period of yeah. time, so it won't be just slightly more data next. And hopefully people will realise that. Yeah, I, 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 I don't understand that, but I, I, I would accept that that is the way it will. Yeah. But um, thank you. 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 I tell you what we do need with car parking very clearly is the Lombard the railway station, which is obviously in today's uh, mint for the application being approved. Because that car parking situation that's where it's getting worse. There's four more cars, which is good in one way because lots of people are using the station. There's more more people parking on that road. But also I know it's down to the other when they start building and get the additional car parking in place. Well, Jim, there's a fact that uh, feeds into that, of course, that while the Northampton you may have to pay eight pounds per day's parking there, or if you go to the Peter's way, seven pounds per day. It's not surprising that when people look at the opportunity to pay paying seven pounds in that regard, because car parking is free at one factory and it proves to be effective. But the impact upon long battery parking once again down the road there, almost slightly tiny cheap, almost to Buckley Wharf, is the most unsatisfactory situation on to casual So I do think yes, to address the issue of car parking at long battery. In fact car parking in general seems to be something that needs to be accepted. Well, that's subject to that, because it's part of the planning application, we're making points that it can't happen until we have to do it. Bills, the houses, and stuff, and then it's sent to cover. So it's needed now, and now it's all the same thing. Also, part of the application, Chairman, should yes. be that Alan Chandler can't get a train at Long Buckley Station, and I find it difficult to get from the road to the platform. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure that uh, this is on the agenda, but. Couldn't we charge the parking at home at the station? Well, the, 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 because you know, eight pound if I can't. Well, what happened there in the history of the is that uh, a few years back we did look at, uh, we were talking to Network Rail about extending the car park at Long Buckley. We were going to tear it like we do in Northampton. Yeah. And if they did that, we were going to actually charge. And in some ways, I think that was good because it would be then a monitored car park. At the moment, it's not monitored. And I do know the cars have been divided in the past, been vandalised there, so you can actually get some vandalism going when it's not, and that's all the car park are in it. Unfortunately, they never came back, so we have tried that before, and I'm sure when this new car park comes forward, I'm not sure that would be something they'll look at <coughs> about the car parking charges on the new extended car parking model. I'm not sure that's part of what will happen in the future. Um, Jim, I'm kind of amazed at the Probably wise to try and step over. Comes, of course, historically. Can I counsel own that freehold, the existing station car park, which is at least never railed, which is leased to the trade operating company, DDC licenses the extended car park from the farmer? It's an absolute. We did it steady, didn't we? We did, yes. This council did that. When the attention to done, my assumption, but I haven't checked, say, from my area, is that the whole thing went over to the trade operating company. And at least then there will be somebody who is responsible for the whole thing and <coughs> to spend a more rational set of that will be secure as well. That will be good. Is there uh, something more balanced than that though? Because I think it's uh, fair to say that the fact that there's no car parking charges at Long Buckley has gone a good way to ensuring that the Long Buckley is, remains as a viable station. So if you were to bring in high or parking charges, it might actually see the demise of the station and be the only one in our district. So, that point has been made before, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. 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 Hold on a second, sorry. You're down to this point. Yeah. 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 To that, this point. It's not the agenda long, but the yeah. 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 I think it's worth crashing <laughs> this out. Connections between Daventry in particular and one of that. So there's a need in that to have significant improvement. We, 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 we talk and talk and talk, talk about providing transport connections and the rest of the obvious thing. And that's about the connections opposite to one bank. Yeah. If that was in some way to reduce the number of cars that are there, then we'd have to go back to see each other and everything. Yeah, we need the cars off the road, basically. But I'm all for free car parking, by the way. It's always happy. 
Um, so hopefully if I can be free in the future, it's fantastic. I will encourage you to use the station from what you said. Right, so Councillor Randall, we you finish throwing the papers right now? Yeah, sorry. Yes, okay. no, I was only putting them together because I was just going to say, just a book. Okay, no, thank, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Luke, do you have your hand up to me? No. no sorry, Councillor Carl. Thank you, Chair. Um, going back to the car park in the country park. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I know it's been mentioned uh, about the increase in size will be dealt with at the appropriate um, uh, meeting on the plan. But I'd hate to see an increase in charge um, to try and claw back some of this cost. So you're advocating um, higher car parking charges? At the car parking charges. That's what you're advocating. Okay. Well, you're entitled to that opinion, that's fine. Yeah, so yeah. that won't be dealt to plan now. So what meeting will that come on this? Car parking for the country park. So, if it's what we're going to go to planning would be the extra space, the local um, rate reserve, so we'd have to have an application and a conservation area. So, we'd find an application for the extra car parking spaces and the new arrangements. Well, so, council council's proposed high charges yeah. there. So, what's, what would be the. No, no, no. no, 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 no,